the, the big stuff on Sub is really like the big instrumental stuff. I, th you know, I remember we were rehearsing at Una Billings School of Dance in Shepherd's Bush, and I had something to do in the afternoon. And I came back, and Mike and Tony had written basically the Apocalypse in Nine Eight. You know, and that's what it ended up being called. This was just this riff: don't, 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 don't. And I said, "Ah, oh, sounds good." And um, Tony had written, not thinking about the time signature, he'd sort of written this keyboard thing, and actually the thing was in Nine Eight. So I, pl I maybe played it once or twice, but never really thought about it too much. And of course, we went in to record it, still not really knowing what it was, but it was just like one of those moments where the tape was playing and recording, and, and it was just captured. You know, that's one of our best, probably one of our best um, spontaneous moments. I still listen to that and can't quite work out, you know, how, how it just all happened at the right time. So. And also the last bit, you know, New Jerusalem, I think that's fantastic. So that's probably um, my favourite song on that. It's funny, looking back, the way it happened, it was never like you knew what you were doing. You know what I mean? We had a whole lot of bits, and then we still start stringing together. And the, it's the first time it happened like this, the second half, you know, the sort of keyboard solo to the end, was really, it showed a bit more of a freedom. You know what I mean? The keyboard solo was just a really myself, Phil and, and, and Tony and Steve, just sort of jamming. Um, and Tony writing stuff over those, that riff we're just playing all the time, down the bottom, with no movement, so he can move around the chords a lot. Um, but the moment when we built to that 666 bit, it was one of those few moments in, in your career where you actually got a great sounding thing, and, and Pete um, came in with a, it's a vocal line we hadn't sung together. He laid it on top. We hadn't been rehearsing it like that, right? I mean, he just came in. We imagined there'd be some singing there, or maybe not. And it sounded fantastic. I like it a bit to Mama. I think the middle eight of Mama and this bit have got similar things where just it, it's really one of those moments in your career where you go in and, and uh, Peter, first of all, and Phil later had laid this vocal down. It's just like fantastic, you know, so strong. So it shows a bit more freedom, you know, because we tend to write songs much more compact, lots of bits in it. Uh, whereas this was a bit freer, you know, you'd stay on a section for a bit longer and let things happen. What I've always loved about this business as a writer, and you learn it as you go along, is that there's luck. I mean, luck does come into it. Um, and things that seem quite effortless, as this was, were always good. You know, we weren't aware when we put it all together that we had a, a really strong thing that was good. Um, but things that happen without the feeling of trying are often the best things, I think. And I think someone really felt, had that sort of feeling about it. I think we were beginning to, f to know who we were as writers and also know how to deliver it as performers. Um, whereas I think, so we were, it's a coming of age piece, I think, in lots of ways. It functioned like the introduction to Supper's Ready because um, it just went straight into Supper's Ready, so people just assumed it was part of Supper's Ready. That's that's fine, but it was it was at one minute thirty seconds of me coming up with something that was based on a on a Bach prelude, I think it was for for, for cello. Um, and I was amazed that, that, that the guys let me put it on the album, to be honest. Um, I remember playing it to them in rehearsal one day, and Phil said, it sounds like there ought to be applause at the end of it. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, thank you, Phil, for that, you know, because otherwise perhaps it wouldn't have made it onto the album. Um, it's very nice, you know, it's slightly sort of, um, I was thinking along the lines of Tudor composers like William Byrd, writing short pieces like the Earl of Salisbury, very short pieces, one minute, 30 seconds. Perfectly good enough for a, for a Tudor composer, but for rock and roll, in those days, nobody told you that you couldn't. Get Him Out by Friday was a song um, essentially about people being uh, um, kicked out of rented accommodation so there was 
I think some of the Rackman stories of, sort of bad landlords and that sort of thing. Um, and I put in a, a little extra thought there about uh, uh, evolving the species to shrink people so that with genetic engineering you might make people a lot shorter, which would mean you could get many more apartments in the same building. Um, and it was done, you know, as a sort of slight uh, comment on attitudes of uh, landlords to tenants, but um, there is actually, I think, a reasonable argument that when, when we are fully controlling our evolution uh, genetically, which I think we will be, um, maybe not in my lifetime, but in my children's lifetime, there may be a decision um, to go smaller. I mean, that's one way of using less of uh, nature's resources and, um, in all sorts of areas. So, um, get short might be a slogan <laughs> of the future. Part social comment, part prophetic. Going out on Friday is a good song, I think, actually. A little example of where, I mean, great lyric, nice idea. An example of where something we did suffer from, we, we, had, we had too much stuff on a song. You know what I mean? The track was great without any vocals. It sounded good, but in fact, when the vocals came on, there's a very clever lyric and a, and a great performance from Peter. It's almost too much in there. As the years ticked by later on, you know, 10 years down the line, we, was, we started to realize that there's a danger in actually not getting the voice early on when you're actually playing tracks, because in a sense, you know, sometimes, in those days, we'd often do that track instrumentally. People go away and come back with the lyric sometimes and, and vocal ideas, and hadn't sung much beforehand. Whereas, you know, sometimes in the later songs, you can just play the chord of A for eight bars, which instrumentally sounds a bit boring. When there's a great vocal on top, it really works. So we sort of had more space later on let the voice do its thing. And this, this song suffered a bit from having just too many good ideas in it. Because there was nothing to sing at the time, Peter wouldn't necessarily sing. You know, he'd be playing his bass drum, he'd be playing his tambourine, he'd be playing a flute, shouting something, singing something. We couldn't hear it because it was in a rehearsal room, no, not very you know, good PA. And we'd get these great things that actually sounded like instrumental things. And then he would go away and come back with a, a lyric. And it would like be, it'd be so crowded, so dense, you know. Um, and the idea was great, because this was like, you know, the idea of running short of space and property, so let's, let's try and get people to live, become smaller, you know. I think it was kind of roughly the gist. But, um, no, we did find that the downside to the way we were writing and the kind of just the technical hearing a voice at that stage meant that we would write these things and they would come back um, a little busy, a little, little dense, by which time it was too late. Because sometimes we'd recorded the backing tracks, you know, and then we'd say, okay, well, you go and write the lyrics for that, you go and write the lyrics for that, and then the lyrics would come back, and we'd put a vocal on, and it was like, <coughs> sometimes. The second best song is definitely Get Em Out by Friday for me on this album. I mean, I think that's a be much better song than Watch of the Sky. So the in introduction is a sort of, you know, is a kind of a bit of an iconic sort of piece, I suppose, with Genesis. But it's, um, yeah, people forget about the other ones. I mean, but I don't know. I know a lot of people who think Can You Sit It In The Coastline this is one of their favourite tracks, you know. So I think it, it's. I think every piece on this would work pretty well. It's just strong. I mean, the, the end of the end section of Can You Sit It Is really good. I think it's sort of well. The first part's good. It's a nice, it's a really good song. And then we kind of, it kind of, it's just a bit fragmented that song. I think that's that's where it suffers slightly. But the, the last part is, is is a good instrumental piece as well. So, you know, I, I just I said before, I, I feel this album is, is strong all the way through. I was less happy with this sleeve than I, I was with the the first two. I think the style was losing some of its a, appeal to me, even though the uh, uh, the Fox character, you know, I think worked. And then um, I'd had this sort of uh, Fox idea, of, uh, really, which would, was related to, I think, hunting and the hunted. And, you know, I was looking at all sorts of esoteric stuff. And numerology was one of the things that 
when I uh, wrote out the letters, you know, each letter carries a certain value, and um, A, B, C, D, E, F, and then next time you come round, you get to O, and then you get to X, all of which are under the, the number six. So then there was the Revelation references and 666 and, and all that crap. So it was, there was a, a, a sort of hidden um, element to it, which uh, we were just playing around with, really. And um, it wasn't the backwards playing devil worshipping version, but, but uh, this mixture of sort of Christian and pagan symbolism was, uh, I think, part of that journey. When I first saw it, I thought, um, I wasn't sure about it, to be honest. Um, if, if I'm honest, it looked rather like a, uh, a kind of collage of unlikely things. It looked like a number of cutouts. Since then, I've I've come to understand the concept of collage a little more, and uh, I think it works. But at the time, you know, I thought this, this is this is just strange. And does it work? And and it, and it had this sort of flat, one-dimensional sort of look because it was collage, I, I suspect. Well, I thought this was the weakest of the album covers he did, certainly at the time. I mean, you come back to it now again; it's rather difficult to sort of to view it as a sort of, you know, objectively. Um, I don't. The sort of the, the, the mockery of the hunt sort of thing. It seemed a bit, a bit of a cliche and everything. I didn't sort of thing. And, and he, it was sort of his idea to kind of do it, to do what he did. And it doesn't really relate to anything on the album, you know. So it was all a bit of a thing. But we, we sort of we managed to make it kind of make sense by giving the album the title Foxtrot, you know, sort of helped to kind of, uh, you know, to, 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 to rationalise a little bit. But I don't think we were terribly happy with it, to be honest. It was just one of those things that, as a group, we weren't that happy with. I know a lot, a lot of people, other people think it's good, but not so much for me. Lovely atmosphere on Trespass, a nursery crime. They felt like paintings and they had a nice texture. This felt a little bit, it was okay, but he just put together a bunch of images that were in, in the lyrics in a sense. I think it didn't really, didn't do it for me. It was a bit weak. Uh, and I guess that's where we changed the next one, I think, actually, you know. Um, trying to move on in a sense. For me, it was like getting a little bit busy. And I guess that was one of the reasons why we felt, you know, we didn't know that then, but that was the last one that, that Paul Wood did for us, because I just felt that, you know, that, I mean, Trespass did have, a, um, you know, an elegance about it, but, and Nursery Crime had, had more, you know, more, more butch, but this was just a bit busy, you know, it was a bit, it looked like it had been, didn't look professional, for some reason, right? the, 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 the fox's head lady, you know, well, a figure, anyway, on a bit of ice, is it, and water, I, you know, it's, it's all a bit dated now. But I mean, it does sum up. The, it does sum up the album, the period. You know, you just sort of, straight away you're there. But uh, what do I think? What did I think of it? I thought it was okay, but uh, not particularly special. I used to wear this uh, UV makeup and bat wings, but it would start the show, and in darkness, you know, you, and then the UV lights would slowly come on, and these big droning chords would appear out of nowhere and then you'd see these two little points of light um, which would be the eyes lit up um, and we had a white back cloth at that time. Well Peter had started you know um, as I said before really trying to find things to do on stage and she developed into wearing these kind of um, you know the masks and everything which on supper's really worked really well I mean the, the flower idea was you know at the time it seemed a bit crass but it just worked so well you know as I said, it's happened at that point I was talking about in Supper's Ready, where the music went from pretty to, to silly, you know, and, and he put, he just sort of suddenly said a flower and stuck this thing on his face. And it just, it was, it was a great, great musical moment.